Welcome to the Trader Merlin Show. It is your Tuesday edition, a little bit of a different show today. Uh, as you guys saw from the marketing materials we put out on Twitter and Facebook, we're going to be talking about trading grains. I was joking around earlier, call it slang and grains with Brandon Wendell. Uh, before we get into that, I want to just big shout out to everybody. Hello, Terry, Tom, Tomasina, Big Eb, Fabiano, Jeff, Raj. Uh, we've got Sam as well, Jorge, and of course Patrick. Welcome back. You, I think you were on vacation, weren't you, buddy? Welcome back, uh, guys. Guest today is no stranger to the program. He's been on many times, Mr. Brandon B. Dub Wendell CMT. How you doing, Brandon? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Fit. I love your view there, and and yeah. preemptive <laughs> congratulations on your anniversary. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I hope you make it one more day. Years where I got married. <laughs> exactly. It's a uh, <laughs> two-year anniversary tomorrow. Uh, I got married in Es, France. So that's the background I got going on the camera behind me there. Nice. Looks looks great. Um, it's a little bit better than what my camera is showing, which is a wall with some graffiti on it and a map of the world, and hopefully I'll be out <laughs> traveling again some point here in the near future. Um, Brandon, we talked earlier, and you said, you know what? What do you want to talk about? You said, hey, in my room, I've been doing really good at the grains lately, so I thought about, let's talk about trading grains because, you know, when we look at futures, it's easy to lump everything into one big category and say, well, they're all the same, and they're not. And before we start, you know, talking about how great grains can be, there certainly are a lot of risks. So, start us off. What, what's your thoughts on trading grains? What's uh, what's been drawing you to that area of the market recently? Well, one of the main reasons I've been trading it is because there have been great opportunities. You know, we look over at the equity markets, which everybody loves to talk about, and unfortunately, it's been very choppy. Hasn't been as clean for some of the pa the patterns there. And uh, over on the, the grains, I've just been finding really good trading opportunities, both not just short term, but actually going into some swing trades and a little bit longer kind of set and forget type setups. And many of these multi-day setups have been paying off very, very well because they're a little bit more stable uh, than you were getting in the, like I said, the equity markets have been choppy. I was talking to somebody this morning who said, a friend of mine on Twitter basically said that, you know, it's it's funny because all these new traders are wanting me to find a trade in the S&P every single day, and there just aren't. There aren't opportunities every day. You've got to be patient and wait for them to come to you. So, like I said, I just kind of switched over to the grains markets because I found good patterns following through. Right. You know, I, I think... You said choppy. I, I think it for me it's a little different. It, it's not that it's choppy. It's just it's been straight up, and there really isn't an opportunity to buy in at a demand zone because you haven't had any buy-in points, and you have no overhead supply, so you got no. And I I know your style of trading. You you like things to have supply and demand zones to to make those trades off of. So I'll, I'll bring up real quick, guys. The the um, let's bring up the S and P just to show you. I mean, I, we've looked at this one till we're blue in the face, but I mean, you notice. It, it's got a little chop, but pretty much it's up every day. I mean, if it's not a green arrow, people are like shocked, right? Well, <laughs> if we switch this over to wheat, here's the wheat chart. Um, you can see it's got big swings and it comes right back up into some supply zone here recently, broke above it. You got corn, which recently just came <clears throat> right into supply zone and ripped down from there. So you, you have zones established that makes it a little bit, um, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna say easier, but at least you have both uh, both chambers of the gun available, so to speak. You can be going long and short here, whereas with the S&P, it, it's just going long at a, at a demand zone. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like I said, there's been a lot more opportunity on both sides. And as I was saying before, you got these trades that are uh, holding on for the trend for a little bit longer period of time. So once more, it's a little bit more stable rather than trying to just jump in, jump out, jump in, jump out. You can actually hold on for a bigger gain and mm -hmm. therefore justifies the risk you're taking in the markets. I mean, there are definitely things you gotta be careful of. One of the main things is you gotta be careful that you're not holding during the closing period. You know, the markets do close at different times when it comes to trading the, the grains versus trading the equity markets. Right. And if you think you're, oh, well, I'm gonna hold on to this until th you know four o'clock Eastern, uh, you're gonna be shaken up a little bit because the markets closed down a little bit earlier. So mm -hmm. you gotta make sure that you pay attention to the times for the closures. Now, there's some really good resources out there. An easy one that I usually use is this. If I bring in, let me share my screen here for a sure. moment. And as you share Start that, um, you know, you talk about times of the day. I know when you know you're trading like cocoa futures or something. There's different parts of the world that are much more significant and, and relevant with regards to producing cocoa. You know, when you're looking at these different markets, does that play into it as well? Saying, okay, I know that uh, this time zone is going to be better because maybe this geographical area is now active. 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, I've traded all throughout the world, so I've even looked at a lot of markets like rubber and things like that that are not even tradable inside the United States. So you definitely got to be more active when those markets are tra- are active. I mean, mm-hmm. sorry, you got to be trading those when the markets are active. Uh, I'm on barchart.com, and for some reason, everything just started going really slow. But under futures, you can go into the contract specifications. So when I go into, for instance, grains, yeah, you definitely uh, – I like to focus on whatever markets are going to be the most volume and active during the time that I'm trading. So yes, the the fact that we have global markets when it comes to physical commodities gives us a little bit more opportunities. We don't just have to relegate ourselves to the U.S. markets. We could trade the European or the Asian markets as well, but trade those in these particular commodities. So yeah, as you can see here, I've got corn, soybean, soy meal, Mm -hmm. but again, there's a shutdown period in the middle of the day, and if you are caught... Uh, it shuts down at 2.20 in the afternoon for soy meal, for instance, right here, and then reopens again at 7 p.m. or 8 p.m. Eastern. So if you're thinking, well, I, I don't have to worry about the overnight margin, well, you do because the overnight margin comes in a lot faster than it does at uh, 4 o'clock with the equity market shut down. The other nice thing, though, also is if you take a look at the maintenance margin and even the overnight margins, the initial margins are much lower. Instead of holding a trade overnight for seventeen thousand dollars, like the Nasdaq, here you can trade soybeans for sixteen hundred fifty dollars as an overnight trade. Mm-hmm. So you're reducing your carry costs and still getting great opportunities, nonetheless. You know, one of the things that I find striking about the specifically the grains and the commodity space is lock limits, and I, I think it would be. Um, doing a disservice if we didn't mention that you know we do have lock limits in the equity markets where okay it goes up a certain percentage and and technically they're supposed to slow it down or if it drops a certain amount they're supposed to lock it with uh commodities like wheat corn soybeans these happen much more frequently guys you can get lock limits all the time and and maybe you want to address that a little bit and talk about some of the risks of the locks yeah i mean that's oh something just happened i can't uh unshare my screen i don't know if you turn that off but (laughs) (laughs) you might be permanently on your screen (laughs) yeah well um, yeah, basically, I mean, you got to deal with those lock limits. I don't think it just shows it on bar chart, unfortunately. But if I go out to the CME group, you just have to be aware that if prices move too far, too fast in a particular trading period, the markets do shut down. So let me see if I just do the CME group here. Yep. It's really weird. My Skype uh, froze, and I'm, all I'm getting is a white screen on my Skype, so I can't even turn off my sharing. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I, got your, I got a picture up. As long as the audio keeps working, we're good. <laughs> yeah, that, we're okay there. Uh, All right. Anyway, so, so I'll bring it back. Yeah, your, like I was uh, saying. Oh, okay. There you go. Yep. So I got there your CME group. Yeah. So if you go to CME group and go into markets, ah, of course I just clicked on the wrong one there. This is it's just lagging real quick on my uh, the screen here for some reason. What you why. get for pirating your neighbor's <clears throat> internet, buddy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. So again, if I go into let's say corn, it doesn't really matter. You just got to go to the contract specifications. You'll see the limits. And generally, it's going to be something like $0.35, cents, which doesn't seem like a lot. But it, when it comes to trading those green markets, that is a, a pretty large move mm-hmm. in one particular trading session. So there it goes. Full contract specs is what I'm looking for. And, and before anybody dives into any of these asset classes, it's critical that you know this. You know, Don't don't go out there and trade corn futures and be like, oh, well, you know, it, it, uh, it just came into great supplies and I'm going to short it. That's fine, but you have to know what those lock limits are. I see a comment here from Sam saying, yeah, that's I was caught in a lock limit against me and that's how I learned what it was. It's bad news. Um, you know, you certainly don't want yeah. that to happen. And of course, when it happens, you're stuck. You can't do anything. So make sure you know those limits. Right. Well, that's with anything. Anything you want to trade, I mean, it's obviously you need to know how to chart it properly and have to have a good strategy that you apply to it. But you have to know the nuances of the actual securities you're trading. And one of the main things that people forget all about is that these can lock you out. You literally get stuck in a position because the markets move too far and too fast. So one of the things you got to be prepared for is if this does happen, don't panic. Obviously, there's not much you can do about it. But generally, I haven't had a lock limit really go against me. I've had it go in my favor because it's usually in the direction of the trend. And as you can see, these are some of the lock limits. They'll tell you for the outrights how much of a move would cause that market to shut down. And when I go to corn, you can see it's actually only $0.25 cents now. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, you got to realize when we're looking at corn, it's kind of funny because people think twenty-five cents. Wow. Well, going over to the corn chart here, let's see where is it here? ZC. And right now you're seeing three hundred fifty-eight. And people think, oh, three hundred fifty-eight bucks. No, that's actually three dollars and fifty-eight cents. That's right. the current price. So when you're talking about a twenty-five cent move, that's a pretty significant move. 
And when you see these lock limits, there, I don't see any on my screen right this yeah, moment. Yeah, I'm looking for some too. I don't see any either right now. Uh, I'd have to go to a daily chart, and obviously it'd be probably big green or big red with no wick on it. Um, I don't think we've had any recently. But again, it's usually going to be in the same direction as a trend. And if you're trading the right trend direction, you should be okay. But just got to be aware that that's something that could possibly happen to you. Yeah, and uh, that, that's all I wanted to point out at is it's just, you know, when, when it happens to you, there's not much you can do. You're, you're stuck in it until the lock is lifted. And, and that might be a time based lock or a price based lock. But um, same thing happened in the equity markets. We did a show on that long, long, I think when I started the Trader Merlin program. So that was, it was quite, quite a ways back. Um, as you know, Brandon, there was uh, you know major damage to Iowa uh, recently. I forget what the name of that thing is called. There's a specific type of storm that came through. My buddy's from Iowa when he was telling me about it. Um, destroyed a ton of crops. You know, Was that part of the reason that you were looking at corn in particular to trade? Or, or do you look at those kind of macro events like that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there's uh, actually a couple of main things we look at. I'm not a farmer. I mean, I grew up near corn, but that was about it. I was grew up in rural, rural Pennsylvania outside of Philadelphia. But uh, my exposure to corn was really just going to get some sweet Jersey corn <laughs> during the summer. <laughs> Jersey but, corn? Uh, Jersey's yeah, got corn? Jersey. Yeah, yeah, right next to nuclear plants. Everything glows. Uh, <laughs> really waste. big cobs. <laughs> <laughs> no, but anyway, uh, you know, I grew up with that. But um, no, what happens is you got to know it. Now you threw me off. <laughs> this is what happens when we get together. We get I off on these tangents. Ooh, squirrel. You know uh, you missed me, Brandon. Come on. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. <laughs> Anyway, so, all right, so, so corn. Let's say we were, we were on the topic of uh, you know using macro events like a, like a major storm, right. and you know you, you're in Florida, so I guess you can look at hurricanes and orange juice pro production. But in this case, it was Iowa and corn. Yeah, and actually, I think Mr. Malibu is saying it's a derecho, derecho, derecho. That's what it was called. Yeah, derecho, derecho. I was that I mean yeah. from the right, right? Derecho esquerda. I mean, uh, whatever. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Malibu. So anyway, yeah, you gotta be, you gotta pay attention a little bit to the the uh, the storms and what's gonna be happening there. Uh, the other thing, you just, I mean, what you can see is if you look at a chart on corn, we had a really big rally from that on the daily chart. So if I go ahead and I'll share this again at the risk of not being able to get it back, but uh, <laughs> no, it's okay now. There we go. So looking at this, you can see we had a big rally in August, but honestly, it started mm -hmm. in an area of demand anyway. So we started off. Uh, if you look back, you see that was the origin of a big rally back in June. All we did was come back down to that area and rallied out of that. So one main thing you definitely want to pay attention to is seasonal seasonality as well. Mm -hmm. So not just the big storms, but the seasonality of these markets. And now let's see, I think I have, I went to this price limit. So let me do this instead. We're going to go out to mrci.com. And this is one service that I subscribe to. There are many of them out there, but uh, I happen to subscribe to them. And right there's my password, dot, 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 you can use. <laughs> uh, anyway, if you log into this, uh, they actually do some really cool things. If I go into the MRCI online, one of the things I pay attention to are seasonal patterns. And basically, if you were to take, especially with the grains, anything that's grown has this kind of pattern you have a seasonal pattern mm -hmm. and so for instance we're talking about corn if I go to the grains market look at corn we're currently trading the December contract so by clicking on that December contract what I'm gonna see is if you took every single one of the charts throughout the year over the last 30 years and transpose them on top of each other what has been the average price movement so let me just do the last 30 years because it does show me last five and last 15 as well so here we are in beginning of September, and I go to that date, and you can see right there, September 1st, in corn, we are typically going to be seeing a drop right now, and it bottoms out right near the beginning of October. Well, if that's been the seasonal pattern for the last 30 years, there's a high probability, again, there may be some weather and other things that disrupt this, but that's the normal pattern. That gives you a higher probability of trading in that direction. Mm -hmm. Now, if I take off, sorry, I want to do this, from the last 30 years to the last five years, we've actually reversed that pattern. So more recently, and of course, you know, we've got what's going on with the lack of uh, commodities because of the, the storms destroying it, you would actually expect the markets to go to the upside. And therefore, right here, beginning of September, you can see in the last five years to mid-October, there's been a rally. So taking that out to our charts, 
that's exactly what well, was happening a little bit earlier now, but you would expect that here we are at a high that we've reached before. Honestly, I'm looking to go long. As you can see, I marked off a demand zone there, 341, 33550, because I'm waiting for this to pull back, and the seasonal move is typically going to be to the upside. Mm -hmm. So that's the really neat thing of having access to this. Uh, the other neat thing is, again, when they're very, very, uh, when there's a high positive, high correlation, uh, actually MRCI and again there's other companies that do this as well but they put out trades and I'll put out I'll just show you the seasonal trades for August here since we're in September anyway but every month they give me 15 seasonal trades that you can take Cool. And if you look at the probability, the win percentage, the lowest one is 80%. It goes all the way up to 100% on some of these. But these are normally trades you can take. Now, you got to be careful. For instance, right here, December lean hogs. They were buying that one on the 28th. If I go into that trade, what happens is it looks like a dream. Oh, my gosh, they made it. They won 13 out of 15 times over the years. Well, not so fast because they had some wins that, you know, for instance, here, there was a win of $292 in 2011, but the drawdown at one point was 968 bucks. <laughs> okay? Yeah. So you can't just blindly go into these, but here's the neat thing. Knowing when the seasonal patterns are likely to happen, combining that with the technical analysis that we know, we can actually not take those drawdowns, but enter at a higher, at a better spot and have higher probability. So that's kind of neat. And by the way, um, if, if you're interested in MRCI Online, I don't work for them, but if you want to and you go into the MRCI Online and subscribe, I have a code that you can use. It'll get you a 10% discount. And the go. code is Wealth and my name, Brandon. So when you go into it, if you decide to subscribe to these guys, use the word Wealth and my name, Brandon as uh, how'd you hear about us and they'll give you a 10 percent discount so uh, i think it becomes uh, 341 dollars a year nice so okay it's up to you if you want it no useful stuff i mean I, I think that there's always something to be said about seasonality and that type of pattern recognition and when you can spot it you know i'm, I'm a big fan of everything works until it doesn't and what was interesting when you went from that 15 or 30 year to the 15 is that whole cycle just kind of shifted over a little bit and of course that is speculators and institutions commercials non-commercials all you know adjusting uh, their, their their purchasing and consumption patterns I wanted to show this chart here real quick just so you guys know that derecho that uh, went through oops that went through Iowa let me get where am I doing I'm all messing up there we go wrong screen uh, the derecho went through Iowa that was the August 10th and 11th so these types of events, there's a, a line right there on the 10th of August, the vertical line. So you guys can see that that really was a major catalyst for this move where it took it from, you know, call it $3.25 to almost $3.66, uh, right up into a supply level. So some nice opportunity there. And yeah, I think if you are trading grains, obviously pay attention to the weather stuff. I, I don't follow weather in Iowa, but if I was trading corn, I certainly would be. Uh, Brandon, what else you got for us with regards to? I know uh, you talked about corn. Uh, you do a little, you did some wheat, some soybeans. Uh, what are some of the other trades that you were making this week? Uh, I was doing some soy meal. I'm trying to see exactly what I was doing. Uh, like I said, in my uh, e mini think tank, I do a lot of my trades there, and I actually just tallied up. I haven't finished all the tracking yet, but for the past couple of months, like I said, I've been doing pretty well on that for uh, the month of July. I'm just trying to see what our final was. I'm, I've got the stats right here, and. Like I said, I track every trade, so eh, I might as well brag and show it real quick. Gloat, Brandon, <laughs> gloat. <laughs> well, like I said, I get to track every trade, but I do. I, I have every single trade in what I call an ideas page first, and then I share those with the students. So let's see, is it? Ah, it's not moving fast. I, everything's locking up on me here. Well, so maybe you you got to get a new internet there, buddy. Eh, I'm running 200 megabytes per second. It should be fine. But uh, you can see for July ended up with a win rate of about 68%. So the uh, if you had a $50,000 account following all those trades, I made 45% for the month. And if you had a $15,000 account and you were using margin on that, it was 151% rate of return. Then for August, let's see, where's the August one? It was on the other screen here, so I'll bring that over. And I'm not done tracking all these because I have a couple of trades that just came in on the 31st. There were some additional wins. But, you know, this is not just a one-trick pony. We ended up doing... <laughs> Oh, sorry, wife just got home <laughs> and the dogs are barking. <laughs> that's the alarm? Yeah, that's the alarm. So right here, let's see, we did it again. Basically, it was a 78% win rate uh, of the trades taken. 78% of those were winners. And as you can see, I had a $50,000 account. We had a rate of return 39%. So again, uh, that's not even including the last day of trading, so it's going to bump up a little bit. So we're, we're averaging about 40% a month, which is pretty darn good. Good, yeah. 
Yeah. Well, I like that you track uh, the individual trades as opposed to uh, someone who everybody knows I hate very much. It only shows you the winning trades and never talks anything about his losers. So congrats for being transparent. We like that. Um, yeah, i got to show all the winners and losers. got to be transparent. <laughs> yeah, well, a lot of people don't do that. Um, they, they just want they just want to sh sell people on showing them their winning trades all the time. Um, all right, so you got any mini think tank. What else you got cooking? What else are you doing? Uh, I've been doing a signature series too. I actually did a showcase today, so uh, I'm focusing on spread trades with that, and that also lends itself. That's another reason why I started getting a little heavier into the grains because with future spread trading, you got a couple of things going for you. Number one, you reduce the margin cost dramatically. Number two, you reduce your risk. And lastly, you can actually increase your rate of return, which is pretty good. So in doing those spread trades, uh, what you're doing is you're you're trading the difference between two related contracts rather than trying to pick a direction of a security itself. And uh, so at the end of this month, I'm going to be doing another one of those um, a signature series class. It'll actually be on a weekend. I'm going to be doing it on, uh, I forget the dates now. Ah. Anyway, I'm doing a showcase on Friday. So if you're an online training academy student, on Friday at 1 o'clock, you can join me for the showcase, and I'll actually go over that a little bit more, what's involved in it, when the actual dates are. Sounds I think it's good. 25th, 26th, 27th. All right. That's short-term memory problems hitting you hard there, bud. You yeah. Seen, you ever seen your moments? It's been a long day. <laughs> <laughs> hey, just remember, you're always going to be older than me. Yep, that's true. <laughs> Damn it. I will. Um, all right. I'm trying to think of what other things. we. So we, we looked at corn. Um, you've also been in wheat and soybeans. What sort of, I mean, are there any setups right now you're looking at that you might want to share with viewers, kind of forward thinking? Well, like I said, I'm looking at corn as uh, some more buying opportunities. As I said, on the seasonal play, we ended up having a bigger rally potentially until mid-October. So I was looking at buying that 341, 335. Uh, let me go ahead and share charts again. Sure. Might as well, right, since I can. You're better, and, you're better uh, at driving when you're talking, so. Yeah. All right, so there we go. We got the corn chart. And uh, like I said, we've got that 341, 335 on the daily chart that I'm waiting for the pullbacks. And as far as any overhead supply zones, it looks like we've got some room to run right here up until, oops, right here. Bring that down. And we got 372, 325. By the way, if you haven't traded this before, every penny, which actually looks like a dollar here, but technically that's $3.41 to $3.72, every penny here is worth 50 bucks. That's a pretty decent move mm -hmm. that I'm looking forward to the upside there. On wheat, what else we have going on there? I'm trying to remember. Yep, uh, same thing on wheat. We earned an uptrend right now as highlighted by the circles. You've got higher lows, higher highs. So right now I'm waiting for a pullback, potentially this 527.75, 516.50, again on the daily chart. And if I get that pullback, I don't believe I had any overhead zones nearby. Like I said, we're, you know, we're nearing the beginning of an uptrend. So I would expect us to continue to go up. And what I can do here for a target is put in the Fibonacci extensions. There we go. And retracement. There we go. So we're getting a little stalling point right now at the 100% extension, but I expect this to go up to about 580. Remember, I'm expecting a pullback, and this would be a good spot for that pullback to begin to pull us back to 527 before we rally up to 580, maybe even all the way up to 600. Mm -hmm. And soy meal was once one that was doing really well for me. And I'm actually in a trade right now. <laughs> Forgot about that one. I was in that trade from earlier today in the XLT. There was also a buy zone at 286. I've been riding since then. Uh, so right now I'm just about near my target. And this was actually based on a Fibonacci extension. That's why you're not seeing lines on the chart there. So we do have, by the way, if you're holding this longer term, the next area of supply isn't until 320. I was going to say, so it's a long ways away. You, I mean, you've got just, just a big, big move up in potential in front of you. Yeah, exactly. There's lots of room to go. So again, I'm buying the pullbacks. You've got higher lows, higher highs. If we do, I'm going to get out of this one first. But before we go in for another long, I'm basically going to target an entry right here about 300. As you can see, drop base rally right there for the demand zone. And then the target on this one, once I get out of the trade I'm currently in, is going to be right up here at about 320, 321. So that's what I've got so far. Nice, well, I like it. I think you got them all mapped. <clears throat> got them all mapped out there, and I, of course, you guys can see he's got his handy dandy RSI at the bottom there. No, oh, of course. Yeah, I'm going to be teaching a lot on that RSI. I mean, I use that RSI as a momentum indicator. Problem is, many people talk about these indicators and they rely on them a little too much. Uh, they read them wrong. 
you know, technical indicators are based on closing prices. And if you're looking for a buy or sell signal on it, it's always going to happen after you've already hit the best entry point right. or best exit point. So you got to use them the way they were intended, which is really just measuring momentum or lack thereof. You know, it's interesting you bring that up. Um, you know, if you're using something like RSI and it comes to that point where it's showing you a, uh, you know, a buy point, Brandon's right. It's probably already after the fact. The bottom, you know, if it, if it came down to a demand zone, that's going to be the ultimate turner of price. But you could be using it as, you know, if you wanted to scale in, maybe add a second portion to it, and all of a sudden you get the signal from RSI to buy, great. I mean, that's using it in the traditional way. Brandon's using a little bit more with um, convergence, divergence, which is a bit more of a forecasting method. It gives you a little bit more of a head, um, at least from my perspective, a little bit of a, I'm not going to say a leading indicator because that's such a misnomer, but it certainly gives a little bit of a head start on price turning. Yeah, like I said, you know, actually, uh, Larry just uh, co confirmed that. Yeah, it's September 25th through 27th. So if you want to learn more about how I use that indicator, more in depth methods, that's where I'm going to be teaching it. It's going to be in the signature series um, on uh, September 25th through 27th. So I'd love to have you join me on that. It's an online experience. And the neat thing is, not only do you do the three days in class, but we're also going to be doing a companion series that goes along with it, where every week I'm going to be basically showing some of these types of trades. And like I said, for the most part, I'm focusing on some of the long longer time frames as well as I'm also going to be focusing on I don't have it open right now but these spread trades and I was saying before when you go to these spread trades there's a lot of great spread trade opportunities on uh, I'm not sharing my screen am I uh, nope not yet you will not be soon yet. yes I am Daniel so says, is that he skin. headset that Brandon's using is any good? Sure if you want to look like a call center in Mumbai <laughs> nobody uses headsets anymore Brandon's old fashioned I actually like the headset. I don't like. I like to have it on there, and I can hear it in my head. I'm, no, the problem is that sometimes I got a lot of background noise, yeah. and with the background noise going on, it's just much easier when I have this directional mic. It works really well. I don't care. Yeah, so. I know. I'm just messing. I think what's great about microphones, guys, is um, I have a a really nice directional mic sitting on my desk, so I have hands free. But if I turn my head or move away from it, the tone will change and sound will change. When you have a headset, uh, if you're doing broadcasting, it's great because it will stay the same distance from your mouth all the time. So there's pros and cons yeah. to everything. But anyway, it's not. It's honestly, not a, I, I get up and walk around a lot too when I'm teaching. So yeah, I definitely want the headset to be able to do that. There you go. So what I was doing here is I've actually got my chart set up now, and as you can see, I've got a watch list for spreads. And what I can do, let me see if I can find my grains here. It's a mix of pretty much everything. Yeah, you got all kinds of stuff. Oh, yeah. So here we go, uh, corn and soy. So for those of you that failed um, uh, calculus, his symbolist might be giving you a little bit of uh, anxiety right now. Yeah. It does. It totally <laughs> looks like a calculus from, a, okay, ZC1 exclamation point times 50 minus ZM1 exclamation point times 100. The answer oh, see, is seven, thing, damn it. <laughs> yeah, that's the other thing you got to know. If you're going to be doing spread trades, these are also known as what are called equity market spreads. And with the equity spreads, it's not equity like stocks, but equity as in we got to make sure that the the point values are equal to each other. Because when you're trading, you know, for instance, corn and soy, this symbol is not bad because it's two times ZC one exclamation point ZS yeah equals seven. No, just kidding. Uh, basically, it's two corn for every one soy. So you have to balance out on the spreads for the volatility as well as the point values. So we're seeing these other numbers, the multiplications, this number of contracts, or it's the point values are not the same. For instance, wheat and soy meal, wheat trades in $50 per point increments, and soy meal trades in $100 a point. So I have to neutralize or basically make them index to one. And the way I do that, yeah, the answer is always D. <laughs> Medic said the answer is always D. Uh, so anyway, when I look at these, like I said, there's a couple of ways of trading these, which are really neat. Like I said, I can do this with the Bollinger Bands. I actually also use my 889 trading strategy and apply it to what's going on in these markets. So we're looking at corn and soy. There was an opportunity already happened where, like I said, using that RSI properly, you had a move down in price, hitting the bottom band, telling us that we're oversold. However, when it came to the RSI, we had a positive divergence at the same time. Mm -hmm. And with that, that's a really nice buy signal. That's the only way you'll actually get buy signals with indicators while you're actually at the buy point right there. So you can see we came into that area and we had a positive divergence while we're still in the area to be able to buy. If you waited for crossovers where the RSI goes above 30 or you know whatever, 60, 70, 30, it, it would have told you to buy way too late. And from there, you can see we went from one side of the band to the other, and that was a nice little spread trade. Yeah, absolutely. 
Uh, these probably saw that question from Nasreen, which you know I think the answer is you're going to make it more complicated than you need to. Need to. He says, can you do more than two spreads, like three or multiple, on a single trade? And and you you could, right? But aren't you going to just make it a little bit more messy every time you add something to it? Uh, well, it depends on what you're talking about. Are you talking about doing multiple contracts? Yes, you can. No, I think he's talking about or, you know, doing the you spread between corn, wheat, and soybeans. You know. Absolutely, you can. Yeah, there are some more sophisticated spreads, and actually, there's even more than that. Instead of just adding different contracts, because yes, you can. You could do something like, uh, well, you can do the whole farm if you want. Literally, I mean, all the different. <laughs> you could do live cattle, lean hogs, all sorts of things, and mix them together. And you could also, um, what was I going to say? Instead of kind of like spread trading in options, instead of just doing a vertical spread where you have two options, you could do things like butterflies or iron condors, where you're doing one, two, one, or. Uh, one, two, two, one, things like that. So you can do other combinations, yes. So it can become a little bit more complicated. The main thing is you really don't need it to be that way. We want to keep it as simple as possible. The corn soy spread, it kind of makes sense when you think about it because corn and soy, if you've ever gone out in the fields, you know they grow in very similar environments, mm -hmm. uh, very similar times of the year as well. So farmers have a choice of growing soybeans or corn. However, you know, say for instance the government wants more ethanol, they're going to give a subsidy for corn to be planted and they may cause more of a crop which would drop the price of corn, but at the same time you would have a drought or a, a light uh, crop when it comes to soybeans and that cause prices to rise. Mm -hmm. So those normally do trade in a certain pattern where corn and soy are related to each other and if that pattern goes out of whack, that's what you're trying to do in a spread trade is trade for it to come back to the norm. Right. Um, all right. Well, let, let me do this. Let's. Uh, I want to see if I get to one or two listener questions here. We had some earlier, so let's see if I can maybe bring one or two of these up. Um, we have an interesting market dynamic going on right now. It says markets at all time high. So Jeff sent in a, like six questions in one. So I'm gonna <laughs> break it. I broke it apart for us. But it says at all time highs. What's the best way to participate in the market? And I think this goes back to our discussion earlier, which is, you know, why did you shift to grains? It's because there's you're not at all time highs, right? So you have these ranges. Right now, it's a challenging market for many people because most of these indexes are at all time highs and there's no, you don't, you can only really go one way, which is buy it dips. Um, you know, so what's the best way to participate in these markets at all time highs? Well, that's, you kind of hit it. Uh, a couple things. One, you can go ahead and just try to find whatever is not hitting all time highs and trade that instead. <laughs> or if you have all time highs, there are going to be pullbacks and there are opportunities on the retracements. Now, if the biggest challenge is going to be where do you get out when you're reaching all time highs, right? So, for instance, again, let me grab my screen here. And there's a couple things you could do. One is if we don't have any overhead supply zones that you know where to, where to get out, uh, for instance, the S&P just broke out to a new high and it exceeded the four-hour zone that I had here. Okay, so let me clean up my charts, first of all. It's funny you say the S&P broke out to an all-time high. I think that that could be said for every day <laughs> for the past month. <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. Now, like I said, because we don't have any sort of a overhead target here, there's two things you could do. Obviously, we have to buy when we have pullbacks, and there are pullbacks that happen. But secondly, to figure out where it's going to go, what we need to do is use Fibonacci extensions. And I've I've actually taught this a couple times in some of the XLTs, but right here you can see when we have pullbacks, you get impulses and corrections, impulse correction. And what I can do is use this Fibonacci extension tool to let me know where the next impulse is likely to stall out. So that being said, it actually worked here to let you know where the probable targets you go ahead and shrink that down. There we go. Oh, too much. And you can see right here we had the impulse correction, and the next impulse stalled out right at a Fibonacci extension. And that was at roughly, let's see. There it is, 100% duplication of the previous move. Mm. And now we have another correction, another extension. We want to know where that's going to go. We could use those same Fibonacci extensions, or to get us a little bit more detail, because we do have a new impulse and a new correction. I'm going to change the color here and do this again on the latest impulse and correction. And what I'm going to look for is where do these overlap? Are there overlaps? And if there are, and these are all just kind of Pretty close. A little off from each other. Yeah. So what you want to look for though is typically if you have multiple Fibonacci's, where they overlap is where you're likely to see it actually work. So again, if I go to the previous one here and change this color, 
Let's see, we'll do orange. There we go. So what I'm looking for is where do we have all three overlapping? Wherever that is, that's where it's most likely going to turn around. And you can see we had two right here, and it caused a little bit of a pullback. So going forward now, what I'm looking for, like I said, is just yeah. where is a cluster, and I don't really have it. Yeah. So without that cluster, I would say that any of these could possibly work, so I'm not going to use any of them. Real quick, before you move <laughs> on, um, that, that high that you have right there, so your Fibonacci peak that you use just to your left, yeah. why did you use the top of the green candle? Because if you go to the top of that red candle, you're probably gonna, it's going to adjust it just slightly, and you may actually get line up. Because I would go from where the highest point of that move. Yeah, I actually could have gone to the highest uh, point. Just curious, just curious yeah. if it changed anything because uh, it wasn't that I, much of a I difference. Really should but... go, yeah, I really should go to the highest point of the move, to be honest with you. You're moving but quick, again, I know. Yeah, I'm doing it kind of quick. Now, honestly, because I don't have any clusters here, I'm not going to use any of those. Right. What I would do now is because we're at all-time highs, there's another little trick, two more tricks that we can use. One is I can stay long as long as the trend is intact. Well, if I'm trading on a four-hour chart, my trend is going to be a little bit bigger than I'm playing. It'd be the daily chart. So what I would do is I actually apply moving averages right here, and I use 8 and 13 exponential moving averages. So what I would do is if I bought on one of the pullbacks, I then go to my intermediate time frame, and I exit only if one of three things happens. Okay, so my exits, number one, uh oh. That sounded like a drop Skype. Right as you're going to go into. <laughs> That's the beauty of technology. Is it 2020? Right as he was going into number one on his exits, guys, it dropped his line. That is awesome. Uh, let's hope it just reconnects because it sure ain't on my end. I've got uh, everything going fine here and I'm seeing no drop to anything. So hopefully that'll kick back in here in just a second. Talk about a cliffhanger. Jeez, I feel like an episode of Lost right now or The Apprentice. Riders are going to get to something good. And there goes Brandon. No! Uh, well, that was interesting. Completely hilarious that we lost him right there. Let's see if I can call him real quick and see if I can get that back again. Uh, be, bear with me as I do a little bit of audio here to see if I can get him connected again. But um, that that's kind of ironic. It happened right as we were going into the three. <laughs> I think something happened on his end because he's no longer connected to the internet. Oh, well, isn't that interesting? Sorry, everybody. Damn it! <laughs> right as you get to the meat and potatoes, it's three for uh, uh, we'll do we'll do it a, a different time. We'll do it a different time. Uh, yeah, the eight ninety eight or eight eighty nine guys is a different strategy that Brandon uses. I've asked him about that on the show, but he's like, no, I want to save that for his signature series and for other stuff. Um, no, he's not. I mean, he might be dial up, Jeff. He might be. All right. Um, if he calls me, he calls me. If not, we'll have to just leave it at that, and I'll see if I can get that continued on for another another show. Um, Sorry about that, guys. The beauty of doing things from across the country. It's Florida, you know? That's just what happens out in Florida. All right, let me uh, go into one last question here, and I'm going to then I'll, I'll leave it open for tomorrow because I have a, a ton of stuff. I'm going to be alone tomorrow, um, so I'll have uh, all day to talk about it. So here is the second question that came in from uh, Jeff. He says, can you discuss market correlations and how to use them? For instance, do you use a demand zone in the NQ as an odds enhancer if you wanted to go long Amazon? Certainly, I would, I would say yes. You want to make sure that you are using um, an index as your kind of the big picture odds enhancer. So if you're looking to go long Amazon or micro, any of the FANG stocks, yes. Um, or even anything of that index, I would say. More specifically, look, let's say you wanted to go long you know, KLA 10 core, a, a chip maker. You know, you could be using the SMH, um, an ETF that tracks that specific sector as your odds enhancer. So it's not necessarily going to be the the Nasdaq 100 itself, right? It might be better to look at the specific sector that that falls within. You know, so if you're looking at trading Colgate Palmolive, you might want to go with Consumer Staples ETF or things like that. So yes, I do think that that is an odds enhancer. It's one way just to get a better idea of how that one is relating to a market or sector. You can also use a performance chart to see if that helps out there at all. Um, let me see if it's restarted yet. Um, if not, ooh, I got the ring, the, the, the Skype jingle, love it. Probably have to pay royalties just to play that one right now. But my guess is this computer's not up, so okay. All right, um, I think that's going to do it for him. Oh, gosh, I don't want to cut him off too quick. Let me, let me go through what's happening out tomorrow. Um, 
and then we'll see what uh, if we can get him back on to finish his thoughts there. So let me go to your economic announcements because there's really nothing going on in the earnings front. Um, I believe tomorrow you have Macy's reporting earnings and not not that great, not that great. Total Kappa, total Kappa. It was almost like I rigged that one, right? Uh, I trust me, that was not planned. He's he's just messaged me that he's restarting his computer, so hopefully it'll be up here soon. That was just crazy. Um, here is your economic counter for tomorrow. The uh, numbers that are coming out, obviously, at Australia last night with their rate announcement. And for the U.S. tomorrow, you really just have crude oil inventories. So that, that's pretty much the major piece. You have a member, uh, FOMC member Mester speaking, so nothing too exciting. A lot of people like to look at the beige book. But I don't see any like monster market movers out here other than an hour and 15 minutes before the market opens, we're going to have ADP non-farm employment change. Now, of course, we do have major economic numbers and earnings uh, unemployment numbers coming out this weekend. For example, Friday, we're going to have the unemployment data. There comes Brandon. Whoop, whoop. So uh, hold on one sec, Brandon, as I finish this train of thought here before I get you back on. Good to have you back with us, my friend. Um, yeah, I'm back. Uh, for the economic calendar, guys, that's pretty much it. There's not a lot uh, for tomorrow other than the ADP non-farm employment change. You can see for Euro, you have PPI, but really not not a heavy day from an economic perspective. And you only have Macy's reporting earnings tomorrow of any significance. So, all right, I believe we're talking about uh, your cliffhangering there. It the closes below at 8 or trades below the 13. You know, How do you use that 813? You said there's three different ways, and all of a sudden it froze, Brandon. That was pretty awesome. Yeah, I know, right? It's keeping you on the edge there. There's three different ways, and they are. Oh, I'll be back later. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. No, my computer froze and restarted. So anyway, I can't run as many programs, I guess, in the background at the same time. So we'll do this again. All right. And let's see here. I am going to I'm going to move this off here. Hang on a second. Yep. Share my screen. I'll put that up there. I got I got your picture up now until we get your screen up. There you go. Uh, by the way, guys, if you want to stay in touch with Brandon, easiest way to do that's gonna be at Trader B Dub on Twitter. He puts out tons of tweets and charts and analysis. I would encourage you guys to check that one out if you haven't already uh, added him on that one. Now, um, let's see. He's bringing up Trading View over there. We should have it up in just a second, and then we'll uh, finish this train of thought, and then we'll wrap it up for today. Yeah, basically what I was going to say is that you know we don't know where the overhead turning points are going to be, so we can stay in until the trend itself ends. And I don't know what is going on here, but it's just taking forever to load this. But so I use two moving averages, so both exponential moving averages. I typically put on the 8 and the 13 exponential moving average. And as I was mentioning, I will exit when prices either hit my targets or if I get stopped out by one of two things happening. One would be, let me just minimize this. There we go. And we'll go back to a different chart. We'll go, let's do NQ. And that just totally yeah, you're in the middle of it there. messed up. Yeah. yeah. Ah. I have that. Man, this is crazy. NQU 2020. There we go. So. And while he this. preps this, guys, let me just tell you this. If you're ever in a situation um, that this happens to you and you get a ton of really weird, glitchy data and you're trading live, stop trading. Don't don't be trading. Uh, Daniel, <laughs> exactly. great question. He says, can we get Steve Mose on the program? I would love to get Steve Mose on the program. Unfortunately, he works for somebody who I can't stand, and I will have nobody affiliated with that individual on this program ever. So, <laughs> nope, no Steve Moses. I apologize for that, guys. Sorry. Go ahead, Brandon. Well, why don't you tell us how you really feel? I can't stand um. the guy. I, I despise him with all my heart. Anyway, uh, so let me put in those two moving averages. There we go. So what I was going to do is this. Edit. And as I was mentioning, what I do is I stay in as long as we don't break the 13 period exponential moving average on the trend time frame. So my intermediate time frame, not the lower one. And the reason why I do that is obviously I want to stay in unless the trend breaks. And then I also put in the eight period moving average. So there we go. I've got two, eight, and uh, that didn't adjust. Hang on. Yeah, you're right. I changed this inputs to 13. There we go. Now yeah, we're doing it. Okay, so. What you'll typically see is I stay long unless we close below that 8 or I break the 13. And I use it in either or. The reason why is if we close below the 8, typically we're taking a break on the trend or it's literally going to reverse trend. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it gets you out too soon. Like this one right here got you out too soon and we kept going. However, back in uh, July, you can see we closed below the 8, actually broke the 13 and went lower. 
So, you know, sometimes it works well, sometimes it doesn't, but at least I have a system right. that is not arbitrary. It's it's based on rules. And again, I don't do this on my lower time frame. I do it on the trend time frame. So I stay in and you can see the NASDAQ has accelerated away from those averages. We'll probably snap back, but if we don't close below the eight or don't break the 13, then I'm okay. Right. So that's one way. Like I said, there's three different things we can look at. Number one was you look at uh, Fib extensions, right? EXT. Uh, number two, we can use moving averages, and number three, look for inverse securities, right? And what you can do when it comes to inverted securities, you look for a security that moves the opposite of these securities that are moving to all-time highs, and you look for them to hit some sort of a demand zone. So if you're not sure what moves inverse of the equity markets, here's a free website. It's back actually on MRCI. Okay. But if you do this, you can see it went to MRCI.com forward slash special forward slash C-O-R-E-L dot P-H-P. What this is going to do is give me a comparison over the last 180 trading days. The first three are the Dow, the S&P, and the NASDAQ. And if I scroll down, I can look for something that's moving opposite. So here, the U.S. dollar is moving opposite of the Dow 67% of the time. 77% is inverse of the S&P and 76% inverse of the NASDAQ. So if the dollar hits areas of demand and starts to rally, you could infer from that that you're likely to see moves to the downside on the equity markets. Yeah. So you could do that with other securities as well. Uh, the Japanese yen usually moves opposite. And you can check in the last 30 days. Right. Yeah, I do like to switch the time frame because we've seen such a weird thing happen over the last you know, 60 days. It's good right. to switch it up a little bit. Exactly. So right here you can see that the uh, Japanese yen, for one, usually moves opposite the equity markets as well. The dollar still has been holding opposite the equity markets. So you can look for whatever securities move opposite or if you've got securities that move with, for instance, lumber. If you look at the lumber charts, they have a 90 plus percent correlation with the US equity markets. They might have overhead supply that could lead the equity markets as well. So you can look for that comparison and look for something that is likely to move with or inverse, and that'll give you a third way of figuring out where the tops are going to be. Nice. Yep. Awesome, Brandon. Well, uh, again, thank you. I appreciate you taking the time, restarting and going through all of that <laughs> stuff, guys. If you want to get in touch with Brandon, he's uh, at Trader B Dub. If you want to see about his signature series, you mentioned he'll be doing something this Friday. I believe he said 1 p.m. I'm assuming that that is 1 p.m. Eastern. Yeah, Eastern time. Okay, so 1 p.m. Eastern time. If you want a little bit more about that program, uh, his signature series will be running the 25th through 27th. So if you want more information on any of that, you can go to tradingacademy.com or to get in touch with Brandon on his Twitter handle, which is at Trader B Dub. Brandon, thank you so much. Uh, glad, you had, glad you have you back from vacation. It's been like, I think, two months since I did the program, so I'm going to be bugging you at least once a month to get you on here and talk markets. So thank you. Appreciate Sounds it. good. I'll, I'll probably pay for the internet bill next time. Yeah, that <laughs> might be nice. You, are you using dial-up? I mean, what do you got there, buddy? That was <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right, That's Brandon. Thanks well, so much, buddy. I appreciate in. it. All right. Thanks All right. for having me. All right. Take care. Guys, that was Brandon Wendell working through live adversity here, the beauty of trading or beauty of doing the show live and using things and different resources here. And so apologize for that one, guys. We at least got the answer done. I appreciate Brandon taking his time today. Uh, all right, I already went over economic calendar. Tomorrow, I don't have a guess, although there was a question from Gary says, uh, where's J-O-D? John finally got Skype installed. I know. I feel like we should just be all raising our hands going, hallelujah. Yes, he got his uh, his Skype installed. So we may, I'm going to see you maybe I'll get him on the program very soon. I'd like to get at least once a month with J.O., maybe a couple times a month because I always like his macro perspective. So uh, that will be where we're headed. Again, if you want to know more about the grains, et cetera, there's a ton of resources at the CME. If you are thinking uh, that there might be some opportunity there, there is a tremendous amount of opportunity, but it's also rather dangerous if you don't know the rules with regards to times that they trade, lock limits, point values, etc. So be really careful uh, trading those grain markets because there's great opportunity, but also goes hand in hand with a lot of risk. All right, guys, that's going to do it for me today. Again, tomorrow I'll be uh, so low. If you have questions, you want something you want me to talk about tomorrow, I'll be getting to Jeff's questions. He had a ton of them, which I can get to tomorrow. But you can also send them in uh, at tradermerlin.com. Those are great way to send in questions. You can post them down below the video on the YouTube channel. That's the another great way. Also, uh, click that like button, or as you guys like to say, smash the like button, hit subscribe, share the show until then guys happy trading I will see you tomorrow